is to make sure um, you use the our fiscal year end checklist that we have out there um, instead of going off of our PowerPoint that we're doing today because the, um, we don't have maybe something um, on the checklist on the PowerPoint and we don't want you to miss anything. So I did include the link here for us. So if you just hover over that in the PowerPoint, um, you can, they will take you directly to it, which is also located in our appendix um, on our documentation. So I just made it a little easier cool. for you to find. Um, if you could please mute yourself, uh, I really would appreciate it. We're just getting a little bit of feedback. Thank you. Um, for the pre-closing um, overview, what we're going to be going over today, um, we're going to be going over life insurance premiums um, to make sure those are entered for any employees that are retiring um, before the fiscal year. Um, also, we're going to do uh, running verification reports for STRS Advance. Um, we're going to be um, also checking the configuration on the um, yesterday's Advance and make sure that box is unchecked and those are cleared. We're going to be going over how to create new con uh, job calendars. Also going to be making sure we do our EMS reporting for the year end and getting ready for the new one. And then any contracts that maybe um, are going to be starting after the fiscal year um, ending and starting in July. So for pre-closing, first thing off, um, we want to make sure that you have any employees that are retiring as of June 30th to make sure that they are entered at the, up to, or the current or future. And, and, and the payroll processing, so they get included when you run their last pay for them of the fiscal year. Because if you don't, then you have to do the adjustment um, entries, which is not as complicated as it was in Classic. So that's a nice thing. Redesigns a little, um, does a little bit more for you than what it did in Classic. So you remember you had a list of things that you had to do. Um, also, you just want to re um, remember that no retirement is going to be withheld on these um, life insurance premiums. So we'll be going over that, and I have a screenshot of exactly what you need to do. I included the uh, publication uh, 15B, which shows how you calculate any amount over 50000 for the life insurance for the employee. Um, so I included that um, link here for you, and the pages of 13 through 15 is where you'll find that. So here's a screenshot of the payroll future. What you want to do is make sure you find your employee, you can enter it on their main position if you like, or if they only have one position. And you can also do a description, which I didn't do here, but you also can put a life insurance, or you can do MC1 if you're still used to the classic type. You want to do the pay type of life insurance premium. You um, can enter a unit of one, or you can leave that blank. It still works. It still stays without entering that, but I just included that. And then once you figure out what that rate is uh, for that employee, you want to enter it here. And again, I just made a little note and highlighted the applies to retirement because um, this box is automatically checked when you do go into future and current. But when you try to save it, it won't allow you to save it. It says and life insurance premiums um, don't have a retirement charge to them. So it won't let you save it anyways, but I just thought, you know, uncheck that before you save it and it'll save you a step. Here is the current view, so you just find that employee, um, life insurance premium. Again, you can have a one entered in there, the amount that you figured out for the employee. Um, you can do a description of life insurance. And then applies for retirement, again, is checked automatically, so you just want to uncheck that and then save it. That way you won't get an error. Um, again, for the life insurance, when the life insurance is being processed, um, you just remember that the federal, state, or the OSDI taxes are not withheld on those. But again, it is added to the wages, the total and taxable growth for that employee, even though no tax is withheld. So just a reminder on that. Kind of odd, but yes, that it does add it to the wages. But it does figure the Medicare or FICA um, for the payment is processed. So those two are, so it's either Medicare or if they have FICA, it will process the taxes for um, those. Um, if they have city, um, there is a reminder that on the payroll item configuration for that city, there is a box whether it is um, taxed or not, taxed or not, 
for that city. And this is where you'll find that. So if you go to that payroll item for that city, and then here at the bottom under in the options, you will see if it's checked or not. Um, most, of, most of these probably, unless it's a new city after you came in to redesign, these should already be set up and you shouldn't have to worry about them. Your district should be all set to go. But again, if it's a new city coming in or, or they had to add one, um, they might want to double check with the city and verify that if they're taxing um, NC1 payments. Um, so if it was not entered at the last pay, um, then you would have to use the adjustment journal, which is located under core, and then find um, the adjustment. And then what that will do is it will, if, when you're entering that, then it will correctly update your W-2 form and also ensure that your quarter is balancing. So what you'll want to do is go ahead and enter it under the adjustment journal under 001, find the type of life insurance. Your transaction date will have to be in a day in a month that is open. And then enter the amount and then you can type in life insurance. Okay. So no manual adjustments need to be made in redesign for the growth and taxable growth because it does it for you. So your W report will automatically uh, adjust for your federal, your state, OSDI, city, again, if that box is checked on the payroll item configuration for the city, and then your Medicare, and so the total and taxable gross amounts are adjusted. But um, if the Medicare withholding was paid by the employee, this is one adjustment you will have to do. Um, so if it was paid by an employee and the other portion was paid by the board, then you would need that to do an adjustment for those figures. Or if it was paid totally by uh, full board pickup, then you would need to or, um, enter that amount in there. So again, I have a little screenshot here. This is what you would need to do. So if the board um, paid, you're gonna have to find the 692 for that employee, enter, find the type of amount withheld, and then enter the amount of, mine was $100. So, just have to enter the amount. What is it by 1.45% of that amount? So that tax is in there. And then also you have to do that on the board side. So you have to enter, find the board annuity apparel item, enter that amount, and then go ahead and save that. But if it, maybe there was an employee that was full uh, board pickup for Medicare pickup, then all you would do is find the 692 board amount of payroll item and enter the full amount for the employee and the board under here. So that would be just one, one entry they would have to do if it was full Medicare pickup. Now for an employee's, um, um, what was I gonna say, lost my train of thought here. Um, yeah. Oh, then they would either have to get the um, amount for that amount withheld from the employee or the board will just have to pay for it. So either or, they have to, have to go towards the, uh, to the employee to get that a little bit amount that they had or if the board said we're gonna pay for it, so then you would just pay for it on that side. Um, again, for the life insurance premiums, um, this gross is not included, uh, is not charged to the USAF side. Um, again, if you have any reports maybe um, that you need for totaling, you can use your pay report for that last pay. You can use your pay amount summary report to verify all the life insurances were entered. And again, on the quarter report, that will show. But also, you can use the adjustment grid for all the uh, life insurances that you had entered in there. If you want to run a report, you can do this. And then you can just verify to make sure, okay, we got every employee that we needed um, entered in life insurance. And I include a little screenshot here. You could just go enter in the adjustment type. You can just find enter life and I'll find all the life insurance. Or you can do a greater or equal to um, greater than um, January 1st of 2019. It will bring up anybody, um, well, 2020 now, and bring up anybody that you had entered um, if you just entered them here in the last uh, month or two. And then you can just run your report, and then you can do a PDF or you can do an Excel, and it will just list all your employees. For 
for the next thing. Um, on the under system, the STRS advanced configuration option there, um, you just want to verify, just have your uh, district scroll through that and make sure that box is um, unchecked. So probably most of them are unchecked, if not all of them are ready uh, before they came over in Classic. Um, but if they already are been on redesign for a year or two and already been run through their first advance maybe last year, um, just double check that. So when they are uncheck that box, that automatically clears those amounts. It will make them zero. Um, if there was an amount in there and if you check that back, check, put a check in advance mode box, it will show an amount in there if they had anything left over. But as long as that box is unchecked for the new fiscal year coming up, it's not going to add it to the new amount that's coming in. Um, it automatically just erases it. So it does not show, it won't show on there and it won't add if there was an amount in there, as long as that box is unchecked. Um, First, for your Estrus Advance Report, you want to go, it's listed under Reports, and it's called Estrus Advance. So now you can start running your reports for um, Advance, and you can start verifying them and balancing them. So the first one you can do is the Advanced Positions Report, and the ones that are um, used to Classic, it's called Estrus Advance Text Report. And this lists any days, projection um, of days to the end of the fiscal year, um, to determine which jobs are going to advance. And it also has their calculation of credit on there. So, and it shows the earnings that are going to be paid through the summer months. We'll also show in this report. Uh, the other report that is out there, and these are all separate, because before when you ran Esther Advanced and Classic, they all ran, um, created them all at once. But now we have it where it, um, each one you have to click on each um, report separately to create them. So you have to create three reports. So to generate the non-advanced position report, this is similar to your non-advanced.txt, which is uh, in classic. That's what that was called. And this will show all your non-advanced employees. So employees that were paid stirs through the year, fiscal year, but they're not getting paid over the summer months and, and not like a teacher. And then the other report, the third report, is your advanced fiscal year to date report. And this is similar to your Estrus advanced report in Classic. And this shows all employees that were paid through the fiscal year to CERS. And this includes everyone that will be advancing and employees that are not advancing. At this time, the job calendars can um, be start getting entered um, for the 2021 school year as soon as the board approves them. And as a reminder, you can use under core, there's an option of the job calendars and there's uh, where you can create one calendar or maybe you want to create a few because maybe you have your secretaries that work through the summer months and you have your teachers that don't. Um, so whatever makes it easier for your districts, um, they can create a, one calendar and then use that one to copy to all the other ones and then they have to tweak them. Or they can create maybe one, two or three different calendars that um, are not similar um, enough that they won't have to tweak or add so many days to or, or remove. So reminder, use the copy function. And then also you want to remember um, they will need one default calendar for the upcoming year for your subs. So here's a, a, a screenshot. Um, it's listed under core and then your job calendars. You want to go to the copy and then once you create that one, or if you have two or three that you um, copied, you select those calendars, and then you enter the start and end date for the remaining. And then you just select which calendars that you want those to go to, and hit the right arrow button here over to selected. And then you hit copy. And those will automatically copy. And then again, um, you might just have to tweak those after this is done. The next thing for pre-closing is their EMIS. Um, you want to make sure that you clear your long-term illness days for your prior fiscal year, the 1819. If that's not been done already, um, maybe that's something that you guys have been working on. You already got your new um, 1920 illness days entered and ready to go. But if you don't, um, you can actually do um, go to the employees um, grid and you can search for long-term illness days. You can filter the grill by any long-term illness day that is greater or equal to one, and it will pull up anybody 
any uh, long-term illness based just for those employees. And then if you want to clear those, if you have maybe pages that need to be cleared, or maybe you just have one or two, you can go in there manually and just edit that employee and just remove those and save it. But if you have, we do have a mass change option out there to, um, to load a definition right in, and it will clear all those employees all at once. So if you do have multiple, um, we do have that option. And then at that time, then after that is done, you can go ahead and enter the long-term illness dates for the next coming, or for this uh, past fiscal year, 1920. Here's a screenshot that mass change under employee. So what you want to do is Sure, I believe that the long-term illness phase is already in the grid for the employee, but if not, you might have to find it under more. And then bring up, uh, it brings up all the employees. I just had my one employee, but again, if you had multiple, and then you go ahead and click on mass change, and it brings this up. If you go below definitions and down arrows, we have, I think there's three options in there, and one of them is the clear employee long-term illness phase. And then you click on that, and that automatically brings this in with a zero value and then you click on execution, and then, and then you go ahead and um, save it, and then automatically will clear all these to zero. My 22 will become zero then. So again, you could do it by edit, by just going to that one or a couple employees if you don't want to do this, but this is a quick way for you. So then if your district has not already completed their EMS year-end reporting cycle yet, um, you want to make sure that you do your CJ um, contracted service, CJ, and your CC records if you do have those. Um, so that was under core and EMIS entry, and I got a screenshot here. So you want to go to your EMIS entry your CJ, so if you have employees that need to be extracted, again, those have to be extracted. Um, actually, you have to go in here and um, create those and send those in, and also do those for the CC, um, and then you just click on the extract CC data. Um, so those are just make sure that is completed um, for the EMIS for this reporting period before we move on to the next one. And I think I heard um, in, that it, the next one, the completion is in August sometime. So August 9th, maybe I thought I heard somebody say. But don't hold me to that. Okay. So then once you send those in, um, you might get error reports back from EMIS and make any corrections to the staff data. And then you can reload those using the SIF data. And we do have a new option that is coming up that um, – I'll bring that over here so you can see it and get it to work here. Under reports, EMIS reports. And this, I think this might have been in the last release. And now you can create, it's almost like a per debt. And it gener you can um, generate employer report or a position report. And this is um, going to be useful for for districts, so if they have, they can check this before they send it to the SIF data collector. They can start running this, and it actually shows where it, what, and it doesn't tell you what the error is, um, but it will show that that employee has the error. And we have, we here at SSCT can go into the app log and find um, what line it is for that employee, and we can tell them, say, okay, it's this, uh, this uh, line and for this employee, and this is what you need to fix before you send it on the SIF um, onto the SIF data collector. So um, I think it's going to be useful for the districts. Um, at least they can kind of sort through their errors before they even move on, and and they can send us those that information, those errors, and we can search for those employees, give them the error, what line it is, and where they need to fix it, and then they can run that as many times as they want. So I think this is going to be nice for them. I know this is something that they've been wanting for a little while. Okay. Oop, Where PowerPoint. did you say you could find that report? That is under reports and EMIS. Thank you. You're welcome. I just wanted to put it, I can't remember if that was already, if it's out there now or if that's coming and then the next, uh, next, next release. 
So, but I just wanted to put it out there. Okay. Um, next is your new contracts. Uh, your new, new contracts can be entered for all employees at this time now. Um, now, it's not like classic. You can go ahead and put your con uh, contracts in and then you can purge them in pretty much um, when you have them ready because the system knows when to pick them up when they're inclusive of the period and beginning ending date. Um, not like classic, you had to wait for the last payroll to put them in. Um, so you can go to go ahead and go to processing new contracts and one of the following options um, can be used is you can do your new contract maintenance. Again, this is similar to the maintenance that was in the new contract and classic. You also have your mass copy compensation, so you can build multiple contracts at one time by, by pay group. And then also you have your import if your districts use spreadsheets to load them in. So the next thing is your non-contracts. So when your new contracts for redesign, they don't have the option for the non-contracts to be built in that option, but we do have it under reports in the, in the report manager. And also it's under the home option where you have all your reports listed there for SSDT. It's listed there too. We just said that it's under report manager, which it is. Um, the non-contract compensation, compensation mass load. So here, if you have your, your maybe your subs, your non-contracts are getting a, maybe a pay raise hourly wage, you can do this in a load instead of going to each contract for each employee and, and, and updating that. And again, that is um, under re, uh, the home option and it's called non-contract compensation mass load. So once you um, build that, you can tweak that uh, spreadsheet to what you need or what um, maybe there's pay groups you're not giving a raise to or, or such. Tweak it and then you save it and then make sure you save it as CSV format. And then you can use the utilities, the mass load option. You find your import importable entity, which would be non-contract compensation. So just remember you gotta find the non-contract. Choose the file from where you save it to your desktop and bring that in and click on load. And that'll automatically update all those um, hourly wages for those employees all at once. So that would be a little time saver. Um, just, I just threw this in here, just actually probably uh, yesterday. Um, if you're using the mass load for non-contracts, um, it will update the compensations that are currently out there, just, just like you're it's just it's updating it. Um, if you're creating new compensations, um, I'll just write in the, um, the employee's compensation um, to add a new one for some reason that they need to add a new one. Um, they can just add a, a new one in and then go ahead and um, archive the old one so that doesn't show when they're being paid. Um, and again, like I said, or the district can just go manually in to the employee's um, compensations and then go to the non-compensations and just um, edit those hourly fields. So it's just a couple different options there. For the month end closing, um, you want to make sure that your June search per, per pay report is in balance. So go ahead and um, under reports and run the search per pay, generate the report, verify, make sure the days look correct for the employees. Um, you want to make sure that the total contribution should equal the total deduction and the warrant checks that were paid to search. And, and make sure that their earnings for the employees equals uh, earnings times the 10% should equal that contribution. Also, Andrew, um, and then you can watch that. Yes. Andrew, there's, a, there's some questions there on the chat if you want to take a look at oh. them. Okay. Um, let's see, where's my chat box? There it is. Okay. Uh, the, let's see, is that the, re what release, Mary, is that for the EMIS one? Um, I will look, oh, looking, oh, Sarah, uh, thank you, Sarah. I yes, yeah, Sarah answered me. that one, and yes, it was. Okay, thank you. And if you have a new compensation, okay. Okay, Carrie asks, if, if you have a new compensation activated, is the compensation start date that determines when it pulls in? Yes. Compensation start date, that is correct. 
So when you get that, when you're running that payroll for, um, and it's included in those dates, the system knows to pay or to grab that. So maybe you have five days on the old and then five days to be paid on that. That's when it is. So it's not going to screw, you know, mess up your, your, um, your compensations like it did in classic if you didn't like purge it right at the right time. Um, redesigns are not as touchy as classic was on that. So that's a little nicer on that. So yes, is, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, but it, okay, and Carrie asked, but it will it still only pay on the old if they are not are pays repaint pays. Yes, it will pay um, the old contract until there is no pays remaining on the old. So you would have to have, um, it would just keep paying until then that new contract's uh, start date, um, it sees that start date and it pulls the, that one in. Um, Carol, we will get instructions on how to look up the errors in the app log. Um, yes, um, I will have to ask uh, the programmers on that one because as of right now, they suggested that the ITCs, once the district sends you that error, um, they suggested that they send it on to us here at the SSDT for us to verify that because I think the programmers actually have to go in and do a search um, for that on the app log. So this is something we have to pass on to the programmers um, actually. So I just want, so as of right now, I think they still, you're going to have to send it to us so we can send them on to the programmers to find that error until, um, if they, or if they come with something maybe later in the future that it, it shows directly what that error is. So, okay, you're welcome, Carol. Andrea, can I ask a question for clarification? When we were talking about sure. compens the compensation, were, we, were you discussing non-contract uh, compensations? And the reason why I'm asking is we have a district that um, their, their final pay, their uh, semi-monthly uh, district, they pay semi-monthly, and it's actually the second pay, I believe, in September that pays off, or it's the first pay, I'm sorry, in September that pays off their contract from the prior year, but they obviously start working mid-August. So if we purge that contract, um, will it just keep paying the old contract till it runs, it finishes up the payroll, and then start on the new one? Yes. Um, from what I understand is if you have an old contract until those pays, pays are equal, it will continue paying. And just keep track of the accrued then, wages and days worked on the new one. Correct. So then you're saying that they're going to be getting paid on their old one and on the new one at the same time? No, they don't want that because to happen. Because of the accrued wages? No, they I just, don't want that to happen. No, they don't want, they want the, I, like, I think they're paid 9-5 and 9-20. On 9-5, they're being paid their last contract for fiscal year 20, but there's days worked, like a whole pay period that is technically on the new contract, but they're still being paid on the old contract. They're, like, way in arrears, I guess you could say, not just a pay in arrears, they're, like, two pays in arrears. So how does that right. work for them? Could Okay, could you send me or open a ticket for that? And we can look into that to make okay. sure to see how that's going to work. I really would appreciate it if we could do that because I would like to look into that a little bit more since you, okay. like you said, you got, they're being paid a little differently um, just to make sure that's going to work um, exactly how that's going to go about. So, right. but yeah, if you definitely or send me an email and then I can look into that and tell me what district it is and then I can go in there and, and, and do a little bit more investigation on that, okay? All right, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. You let us all know about that because we all are, have districts like that. Exactly. Okay, sure. Sure. Okay, yep, I can just do an email. Yeah, Andrea, I think the, okay. concern, is, the concern is obviously it's looking back at that calendar and say it's a teacher, well, you're not giving a different, or at least in classic, we never gave a new calendar name to it. So let's say it's calendar one, two, three. Um, it was last year's calendar also going to be the same name of the next year's calendar. If it's paying through, our concerns are that it's going to pick up work days of the new year on that last payoff um, because that calendar still exists. So it may have, it may be reporting work days on the new fiscal year when in essence it's paying off the last year's. 
So I think our concern is, and, and I, I think I'm speaking for several ITCs here, is do we need to be mindful in creating calendars now based on fiscal years so that they have a different calendar name each year so on these overlaps that we're not picking up next year's days on last year's payoff? Okay, so I think probably what, what we'll have to look at is making sure that the stop date of the old contract doesn't overlap the new contract. Right. The problem is, though, if you make the stop date, um, say they're going back to school August 15th, you make it August 14th. And uh, right. that, that actually, the 14th falls on the, is almost at the, the pay, pay period for the 820 pay. Well, 9-5 pay those other day. you know, they still have that one pay left. There's no work days, but the work days are for the new contract. The whole pay period is for the new contract, but they aren't being paid on the new contract. They have one more pay left on the old contract. So they're, they're like two pays out, like I said, not just one. Oh, wow. They're like two oh, pays okay. out. So it becomes, okay. you know, and I, my thought was even to come right. up with um, – calendars like 260 odd for the odd years i'm sorry 185 odd for the odd years to uh, 185 even years so you can overlap those contract uh those calendars but i don't know how the system would pick up the i don't i don't think it would have a problem because it's for the same position right these are just thoughts i'm sorry <laughs> No, that's fine, and and they're very good because, like I said, that's going to become an you know an issue probably in the August September. So you know, let's get ahead of it and see if we can find the best solution for those districts. So, um, so definitely um, open a, a ticket for that and and let me know who the district is and kind of uh, the questions about those, and then we will I will get with the programmers to make sure um, we, they won't run into issues. Well, we had a situation as well similar where uh, they put in calendars for next year and but haven't done new contracts but it changed the unit rate and changed the number of work days on their current compensation so I'm hoping that doesn't affect their advance or anything but, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. It's not going to. I, if you guys say it's not going to, but, you know, they added their calendars and there were five days that fell in August, but their, their compensation stop date falls after that, even though those five days are for the next fiscal year. So then looking at the compensation, so it added changed. five days to their work days and changed the unit rate. Oh, I did five days and changed so the don't, unit date. Yeah, so I don't, hope it doesn't affect the advance or anything, but. Hmm. All right, I'll have to ask the programmers on that, that if there is a time frame that a, the new contract or the new calendar shouldn't be entered yet if that's going to affect something. Okay, I will have to ask the programmers on that one. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have another one. Um, this is happening with the district I'm working with now as well. They would be paying off, okay, 1920 school year calendars. Yes, if you can open tickets for that, then we can look, research those a little bit more. I appreciate it. Um, okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Um, if there is any more questions right now on the new contract part of it, we'll go ahead and get um, going. And then we'll, again, we'll make sure we get that um, settled with the programmers and get back to you guys on that. Um, for the month end closing, the search tape file, um, to create the search tape file, um, once you got everything verified, sorry, I'm, I have to get back to where I was. Um, you want to click on the generate submission file and then save the file to your desktop or folder of your choosing and then you can upload that submission file to eSearch. And then uh, your June, the last June for fiscal year is done. 
Um, for month and closing, so you're reconciling a check and make sure your benefit accruals. So um, under payments, um, the check register, um, here you can use this to reconcile or auto reconcile checks. You can go ahead and um, reconcile checks, um, each one manually, or you can click a few at a time, or again, you can use the auto reconcile checks option, which will reconcile on multiple. Um, again, you can run reports for the, uh, under the uh, outstanding checks report to get a, a list of any outstanding um, checks that are still out there. Under reports, you can do the payment transaction status report to find all the outstanding checks payments, um, and you want to select paid for the payment transaction status options when you're running this report. And then this will give you a list of any of the outstanding checks. Um, you want to make sure that your payroll, your payroll account is in balance before moving on for the new fiscal year. And then the processing benefit update and projection, um, you want to make sure that you did all your accruals, probably if you have sick leave or vacation for the month of June if you didn't do that yet. Um, then you, for, you want to go to report and you want to run your quarter report. And again, um, this is similar to your um, classic quarter report. Uh, what it does is this lists all your quarter to date fiscal or figures, which comes from the historical payrolls that were ran for the quarter, and then any adjustments that maybe were entered for the quarter. So those will show on there also. So again, you want to make sure you compare the totals of the outstanding payable checks that were written to the quarter report totals for each payroll item code. Um, again, we also, just a reminder, if you have any payroll items that are combined by the payee, um, just double check those. And then if there is any differences, you just want to make sure you get those resolved before moving on. So what you want to do is take your compare the total gross listed to the total of all your payroll clearance checks that were written from the USAS. And then you want to subtract the gross for the payroll checks that were voided during the quarter to the payroll clearance checks that were written. So here is the screenshot of the total summary at the bottom of the quarter report. and just shows your total gross. So to balance the, the balance, the calculated adjusted gross is a little different from classic because we don't have that difference, that, that difference line that we used to. Um, so can, oops, sorry about that. There you go. So you want to balance the calculated adjusted gross on the quarter report. So how to do this, you take the total gross minus the total annuities, and then you want to add any non-cash earnings. And then this should equal your calculated a gross. So you want to make sure that these total gross minus annuities plus your non-cash earnings equals this amount, amount right here. So if you're off, then you can verify your total annuities equal um, total of all the outstanding payable payments um, that were made to any annuity companies. Um, also, you can run the an audit report um, and look for any manual changes to the total gross applicable gross, payroll item annuity amount that, um, that were withheld, and then any changes to the federal applicable gross also. And again, we suggest running the auto report maybe like small, small amounts, like maybe at a month at a time, or maybe um, it's just, it will complete a little faster. And then also you want to verify any non-cash amounts. So again, just double check to make sure that this calculated adjusted gross um, equals when you calculate that. So the next thing to do is start running your W-2 report. Um, go ahead and, and um, balance your W-2 report. Um, again, um, we suggest maybe your district's running it um, every quarter or maybe running it every month um, just to verify that things are balancing and there's no errors. So that way at calendar end, they don't have um, a lot of errors to go through. Um, check their payroll item totals for their taxes and annuities, 
And also, they can also do a complete imbalance on a W-2 organization sheet if they want to do this um, every quarter. So that way they can make sure that they're balancing for your end. Okay, you want to make sure you don't have any outstanding payables that are left. So you want to go to processing and processing outstanding payables. Uh, make sure that your grid is empty. Um, if it is not, you can run the payable report and select all the payroll items and then um, you can verify that you can have that report. Um, again, generally, we don't like to have any outstanding um, payables at the quarter end, and so they want to make sure they get those paid before they move on. Um, for ODJFS, um, again, you want to make sure they run their ODGS for the quarter. Um, if the ITC, if you still do that for your districts, um, go and just make sure they get the file into you. But if they submit their own, um, they have the option under the ODGFS configuration. Um, they have to check the district will submit own file to ODGFS, enter the transmitter title, phone number, and then this will give them the option to actually submit the file themselves. So the next thing is, is go to report send to ODGFS, um, generate the report, make sure they check over all the totals and weeks. Um, the taxable wages that are listed on the report is used for only contributing employees. And again, this is all calculated on the ODGFS rules. So right now, the taxable wage base is set at 9,000 for 2020. And again, if this is met for, that, for your employees, they will see a zero in the year-to-date taxable wage column. So that is why that column might be zero for some employees, because they already met that. Um, again, when all the data is correct, then you can go ahead and generate the submission file and save that to your desktop or folder of your choosing. And then, again, securely, uh, they can send that to you at the ITC if you're still submitting that, or the district can send the file on then to, to, and upload it to ERIC. So here's a screenshot of the ODHS report option. Um, make sure they have the 2020, their second quarter. They can generate sort by any um, and by employee name or ID. And then this bottom part here is what the districts that have that configuration set to submit it on their own, then they will see this option and then they can generate the submission file. So for the fiscal year in closing, so after all the June pays are completed, um, again, if maybe you have some uh, district staff employees that are going to be paying off, um, they can change those numbers of pays in the contract. Um, and then also be cautious because this will change the paper period once they do that. So now for the final of the estrus advance, um, now they can um, generate these reports, and then again, it's all under reports, so we'll go through each one. So the advanced fiscal year to date report selects all the employees and jobs that were with SRS withholding. So again, these are all the employees that the amounts were paid to the fiscal year. Um, service credit, again, is based on the decision tree for um, SRS. And then any um, part-time employees double check those to make sure they're getting credit. So every employee, even part-time, if it's very little amount that they made, it should show a 1% because part-time employees did get changed on the calculation, and we do have that under um, our SRS advance at the bottom um, in our documentation, the new way of how um, the part-time employees are being calculated. And we did make a change just recently, like I said, that um, even part-time employees that um, maybe made very not very much, maybe uh, subbed one day or something. Um, they will get one percent now. So it wasn't. So an error doesn't come on the OD or on the um, SRS advance report. Um, again, for the jobs to advance, um, you will have to make sure the work days equal days worked. Any amount remaining to pay is greater than zero, and then your pay is greater than pays paid. Um, the report will have the accrued contribution amount calculated for them over the summer months. And again, this is the accrued amount that would be the earnings not yet paid um, times the employee's stirs withholding rate.
The accrued contribution and how that is calculated is using the pay per period from the compensation record for the employee, remaining pays minus one, and then the last pay calculation occurs. So this is pretty much the same as what How Classic did it. Um, it takes their obligation, their pay per period, and then the pay is paid. So they have 26 uh, total out of um, 22 remaining, and it calculates your 23rd, 24th, and 25th pay. And then for the remaining last pay, it just takes um, the remaining 15,000 times the 14%, and then it's to $210. So it's just um, 56 cents difference. So the system does all the calculation for them. So their accrued amount over the summer months will be $841.68. For the advanced position report, this will list all employees with accrued contributions um, calculations. Um, that will be over the summer months. Um, again, uh, may be inflated again if if the increased compensation flag on the payroll item 450 for that employee is, in, uh, is checked, and also on the 691, um, that rate will be with the inflated rate. So again, the increased compensation um, it may be inflated. Um, the report should be checked very over very carefully. Again, it should be prior uh, consistent with prior years, um, except for maybe some new employees that may have come in for that fiscal year. But it should be consistent. Um, double check if you have supplemental contracts that are maybe being accrued over the summer months. Um, always double check those. Make sure they're not getting missed. And then the non-advanced position report, again, this just lists all your employees that are not advancing. So you want to go over that and to make sure that maybe um, they're on this report and they shouldn't be and they should be advancing. Um, if the job has no amounts remaining to be paid uh, but meets all other criteria, it will be on the non-advance. And if the days work plus remaining days from the calendar through June 30th exceeds the total work days, they will be on the non-advance. So again, just double check all these. The advanced fiscal year to date report, and again, this is a complete fiscal year to report for all STRS employees. Again, this one including all employees that were paid through the fiscal year plus the advanced employees. For the fiscal year in closing, um, you want to check the reports for warning and errors. Um, there is now in STRS advanced documentation um, a list of all the messages and possible solutions. And if you click on, um, if you go to our SRS Advance, we have them listed there. And I also have them underneath our, um, our 2020 fiscal year end meeting on the wiki. So you want to make sure you verify the service credit for your employees. So any employees with 120 more days, um, they will receive automatically 100% credit. Uh, but if you have employees that are less than 120 days, um, and then again, it's going to be based on the STRS decision tree. And like I said before, for employees that are part-time, um, the service decision tree, um, again, that depends if they're marked as full or part-time field on the 450 must be set as needed. So make sure if you have part-time employees on the 450 record, um, there's an option to go from full to part-time. <clears throat> And again, if your district is uncertain as an employee status, they can always contact the STRS, and they, they will definitely be able to help them and tell them um, with any questions that they have. Um, a reminder, if you do have re-employed retirees, they will always show with a 0% credit reported with the contributions. Okay. So again, like I said, new, new for STRS advanced calculations, the part-time employees, if there's a new um, way how they calculate them, and this came effective for the STRS advance. And then if you have any information, um, again, I included the wiki uh, for documentation. If you click on that, it automatically will take you to that link, um, and that will tell you um, what the calculation is for the new part-time employees. For any staff rehi retiring rehired in the same fiscal year, um, again, they will appear twice on the report, just like they did in Classic, one for the line of contributions that were prior to the retirement, and then one line after they retired. 
And again, always have them verified and make sure that rehired retiree box is checked on the employee's 450 payroll item record. For the advanced fiscal year to date report, um, the balance the amount showing in the deposit pickup column to include on, included on the report. Um, again, it should total any outstanding payable checks already written to payable to STRS, um, plus any of the UCS checks for the pickup amount. So that is how you would get that total. Um, if it doesn't balance and it can't be resolved by your district. Um, again, they can always contact you, and and you can actually you can send it on to us if you need some help. Um, again, SDRS can usually find the problem if they want to give them a call, um, because STRS always balances the employees, um, and as well by the district, so they can help them actually balance the that employee that they have question on. So once your advance is correct and they're ready to go ahead and generate the submission file. Um, once they do that, what that does then is sets the advance flag on the compensation record and it checks it. So on the employee's compensation record, the estuary's advance will then be flagged and checked. And then what it also does in the STRS advance com configuration under systems, um, the advance amount, it also checks the advance mode box here and puts the amount in there. And then it creates the annual reporting submission file. And then this re, um, file needs to be sent to SDRS Advance. Um, again, if your district still prints off um, reports, they can um, print them off or save them as needed. But again, they will be under the file archive on um, the fiscal year and reports. So they will find those reports there. Um, before they actually send it to STRS Advance, for those districts that have third-party data like uh, Renhill, um, they need to make sure that you do the merge process for them with that um, third-party file to the STRS Advance file before they actually um, send that file to STRS Advance. So it's just like normal, like the classic, um, you will have to probably put it, I think, in your classic to actually do that merge file um, process. And then you can send it to securely send that um, to the district can send that file to you. Um, they probably want to make sure they send it to you securely in an email. And then you can merge that file. And again, the merge um, process, we have that included on the wiki um, for the fiscal year end. Uh, Mary had a question. Uh, do you correct errors on the non-advanced report, such as days worth, less than days on Contrary to 630, but all should have worked the same as in classic by updating days worked on the position compensation record. Yes, I believe that is how those errors will be fixed. I can double check on that, Mary, just to make sure that it's working the same as classic. So I will make note of that. Um, the next one, um, you want to go to reports and you want to run your SERS surcharge report. Um, any additional employer charges um, levied on the salaries of the lower paid SERS members. So the minimum annual compensation is actually determined annually by the systems. Um, and then what you want to do is take the the, the minimal annual fiscal year 2020 compensation is 19600 at the moment, so the search charge um, knows what to calculate on, and it creates a worksheet, worksheet districts might use for search, search charge, and then it calculates what the verification should be on that worksheet. And then also the worksheet that they get from SERS, then they can um, compare these. And I also caught it, uh, included the link um, that they can go right to um, SERS for the processing of the SERP charge for the complete details. Um, if you have to correct any mistakes, um, if apparel has not been processed um, for the new fiscal years, 
and you can there's a mass change definition. Um, again, we included in the in our wiki and our um, where you got the um, PowerPoint from. Um, we included that in there, and you can create a SIRS of, uh, allow for the SIRS advance field on the compensation record to be changed back to false. So uncheck them, and and then that would be false. So then the system, um, you have to go into the system configuration advance and uncheck the advanced mode flag. So you have to do those two things. Un uncheck it in system under the advanced configuration and again do the mass change procedure for the employees. And then once you're unchecked, the amounts will be set back to zero. And then you can go ahead and correct any of the mistakes that you need to and then you can rerun and create the submission file again. But if your payroll for the district has already been processed after the advance, has been set, then they're going to have to contact STRS and make all the file corrections with them. So during the payroll process, um, just a reminder, uh, it, it's a little different than classic. The fiscal year to date amounts in the 450, 591, and 6991 payroll items. Um, it will show both the advance amounts and the new earnings. Um, so that does get added in there. Um, it's not like where um, it showed just the new earnings for the for the July, August. Um, to see what amounts are advanced, um, again, you can use the Checkster's Advance Report under Report. Um, every payroll at the bottom of the pay report, um, there is a little segment that says Payroll Items Stirs Advance. They can keep track of this maybe in a spreadsheet and then they can um, keep track of what their pay amount or what each payroll was and adding them for their advance amounts. Um, I also was working with an ITC uh, a month or so ago um, with creating a, uh, a .json file for, um, that pulls the employee's name, pay, pay dates, S-series advance girls, total STRS advance, and total STRS not advance. Um, I think I included that uh, out there on the wiki under the fiscal year um, information. Uh, it's called STRS advance report, .json report. Um, you might want to take a look at that. Don't know if that would be helpful to keep in track um, what is advanced and what is non advanced. Um, this is just an example of the report that I, I created. Um, not sure if it will be helpful, um, but I thought if, if need be, it's something that you can use to find out, like it shows your total non advanced amounts for by new earnings, and then what was your total STRS advance, and then also gives you a gross for STRS advance for each employee. So I don't know if that would be helpful, but I thought I'd add that for you. Um, during the advance cycle, certain pay types um, cannot be used when, when jobs are being paid and why they are in advance, and that is a reg or um, an irregular one, IRR. The post-closing, um, the certain pay types affect balancing for the SERS advance um, and configuration. So maybe uh, if you had to enter a DOC or a BCK pay, um, a termination pay, which is usually a few cents difference, or a POF. So again, if you're paying off employee, that definitely will make a difference if you're paying them off early. Again, um, you can change the number of pays to be modified so the pays paid are different by one, and then this will force the employee's contract to pay off. And then again, um, that's going to change the amount on the STRS advance configuration. Um, the amount paid back in the system's STRS advance, um, it will increase every payroll. So every time you run a payroll, the amount paid back will increase. So hopefully that will equal um, what the total of the, um, the configuration and those two figures match. So after all summer pays are completed, hopefully you're at a zero and then the STRS advance check is unchecked in that configuration screen, then you know that you balance completely. But if it's still checked and it's still showing amounts, then you know that you have a difference between the two. So after a last paid, um, paid, so if the amount is not paid back, 
they will have to run that check STRS advance report, which is located under reports. Um, and then also what happens if they accidentally uncheck that box and there was an, a difference, they can go back and check that advance box again and we'll bring up those two figures again. It doesn't automatically erase it, so they can go back in there and check that advance box and and it will show again. But if they do this, they just want to make sure that they uncheck that box before they move on with their first pay of the new fiscal year. So they don't want to leave that checked before they move on. Or once they come out of advance, excuse me. So this is the advance amount will be the total amount when you run the submission file for or to generate the SRS advance and then every um, pay, the amount paid back will be added to this. And hopefully these two figures, the amount advanced and the amount, uh, amount paid back is done after that um, 26 pay. So again, like I said, if it doesn't zero out, then you can run the Checkster's advance report and compare with employees' totals that you ran on the advance decision report earlier to see whose amount is off. Um, and then you will have to file the corrections with the STRS as needed. Um, and then go ahead and uncheck the advance mode flag so the amount shows zero. So once you uncheck this, then they will go to zero and it's like wiping it, the slate clean so then next this year, it's not going to re-add to it. So just make sure that is unchecked. Had a question, what happens if the advance is not unchecked and they process their first pay of next year? I will have to ask the or programmers on that uh, exactly what the what causes the problems that will cause. Um, I I'm wondering if if they do that 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 amount will get added into the amount paid back because it's it's still saying it's in advance. But I will double check that, Carrie, um, to make sure to see exactly what will happen. Um, could there be an error notification to proceed? Um, again, I can ask our programmers or create a um, ticket on that, a uh, jury issue to see if there maybe could be a message be when you're running payroll to say that your SERS advance is not unchecked, which would, um, I, and there, there could be a jury issue out there for that, so I will have to double check that, Marge. But that's a good idea. Um, and then for EMIS fiscal year end um, window closing, um, under the EMIS reporting configuration under systems, um, once you have closed it, which I think is in August, you want to make sure after you got your EMIS closed for the fiscal year, then you want to change your 2020 to 2021. And, and um, from what I heard, I think I heard this um, last Friday, um, somebody has stated that the closing is August 8th. So after EMIS fiscal year and um, reporting has closed, um, you can go to the compensation. Um, you can filter using the compensation stop date or discretion to pull in all compensations for the fiscal year 1920. So you would have to make sure all those old compensations are entered um, if false and not true, because if not, they will get pulled into the SIF data collector. So as of right now, they still have to do reportable TMIS and change those old um, contracts to FOSS so they don't get um, selected in. Um, there is a mass change procedure that you can do this. Um, if you go into the mass change um, and select all the employees that have the FOSS um, report to EMIS, or true, excuse me, for those fiscal years or for that fiscal year of old compensation. Select the down error in the property, report it to EMIS, and select FOSS. And then you can execute that and those switch all those to FOSS, and then those won't get included in the next year reporting. And then here is just execution mode and submit the mass change. Um, again, for the EMIS checklist, I included um, 
a, the link right here. You can just hover over it and it takes you directly to that in our documentation. And also if you're a new fiscal, a new a school for the new fiscal year, um, what they need to do for the staff EMIS checklist reporting. Okay, I think we've gone ahead and Andrea, chat. yes. Quick question: Has the SSDT? I haven't looked, so my apologies. I'm going to cheat and ask right here. Has the SSDT created a mass change for archiving compensations as well? I don't believe they have. I will let me look here. And you want it to store the mass change of an employee? Yeah, so the thought process is um, because with history, all of those compensation records that would be out there, you know, we've been telling districts already about flipping the flag to know and know about that mass change that's out there by the SSDT. But I have not looked, and so again, my apologies. I just didn't yeah. know if there was another one because if they're already doing that and they're already filtered um, to those compensations to flip them to know, if we could use the same filter and a different definition um, for the archiving piece. Um, if, if, you're, if you're talking about the employees under core and, and archiving the, no, those I'm old employees. Talking, no, I'm talking compensations. So again, we're mass changing false to, to the EMIS reporting on compensation. So they've already got And then you just want to be able to archive those compensations. Correct. Okay, um, let me check. I don't know. We don't have one under there, but there probably is one that you definitely could. Um, yeah, archives. And you can do a mass change and find pull in those um, compensations that you want to archive and then switch it to true. But we don't have one that we have created from the SSCT under the load definitions. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Bonnie had, can contract amounts be changed while in advance? I don't believe that is, I think that's the same as classic, that they don't want to change those because that could screw up the asterisk advance. Um, I mean, if you're paying off an employee, I mean, that would be like a payoff. But to change them, um, I don't think they, I don't think that is suggested. Um, Carrie, is there a mass change to change the new compensation to EMIS reportable true? Yes, there's one for to for true too. Um, let's see, what was that? Was that under employee? Yes, we do, and 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 I also included that in the wiki. Um, there under our information. See if I can pull that in here. I can put that here. Um, well, where is she at? Maybe I moved it over here. But it also I have that. Oh, right here. Sorry. Got stuff popping up on my screen left and right here. There we go. Um, right here we have the definition. Um, um, let's see. Oh, nope, sorry. That was for the S3's definition, false and true. But I do have one for the, let's see, where was that, Carrie? Mass change procedure. We do have one for the mass um, for compensations for reportable too, just like we do for FOSS. So we do have one though. Is there any other questions on this information for fiscal year end? Um, I took a, a chat of the. And I will save the chat here, and then I can make sure I go through um, the information and ones I need to get back to, or I'll just send out a full chat to everybody, uh, letting everybody know um, some of the answers on that.
Andrea, I went ahead and made notes as well, so I'll send those to you. Okay, thank you. All right, then I will give that over to Amanda. Stop sharing. Okay, Amanda, I think right. you should have it now. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think I'm looking at the time, and it's about 10, 10, 10, 10, 11. Let's take a quick break, um, just in case anybody needs to stretch their legs, refill their coffee, and I will get started up at um, 10, 20. Let's do that. All right. It's about 10:20, so we'll get back um, back up and running here. Go through the use as uh, redesign fiscal year end information. Um, there's not too much to it. We're going to talk a lot about um, some of the setup for the period H reporting. Um, but before we get into the presentation, I want to show you where to find it. So um, I'm on the wiki main page, and if I go to the um, SSDT meetings and trainings page. We have in here sections for the classic documentation and the redesign documentation and uh, the 2020 fiscal year end information can be found right through this link. Um, we will put the webinar recording on this page as well as the normal training page. Um, and um, this information, I know Andrea had this pulled up earlier, so we saw um, some of the USPS links there. Um, there is a uh, fiscal year end checklist so uh, this link will take you directly to that. Um, that is in the appendix of our wiki as well. And uh, there's some supporting documentation, some walkthroughs um, if you need that. And the presentation that we're going to go through today, uh, that PowerPoint can be downloaded right from this link. So you just click on that and uh, download it to your computer. All right, so um, we have the generic fiscal year and closing procedures for 2020 that we're going to go through. Um, I'm going to try and hop back and forth from the presentation to uh, we'll look at a couple of things in the software too. Um, but this first page just kind of goes through the documentation. So this is what we actually just saw in the wiki. Um, so just a little bit of a reminder there. And first we're going to talk about the pre-closing procedures. Um, these can be completed prior to closing for fiscal year end. You can actually start doing some of these things now. Um, they can double check um, these first couple steps right away uh, if they have the information available. So the first thing is going to be um, under organizations, under your core menu and organization, um, there are two boxes if you scroll down to the bottom. One is for the central office square footage and one is for the ITC IRN. Uh, we actually took a peek at these boxes on the migration uh, training that we did a couple weeks ago um, because sometimes this is nice for them just to enter in when they come into redesign um, and get that out of the way, but it is required uh, that they would need to have that information when they pull the, their um, reporting for their financials. So they just want to double check at this uh, step and make sure that that's filled out. Um, also year to year, if things change, you know, if they um, did change uh, buildings for their central office, their square footage might have changed. Um, so that should just be reviewed each year. This next step is the building profiles. So um, this is located under the periodic menu. This is similar to that building mate option that they had in classic. Uh, basically they want to enter in building profiles and um, enter the square footage for each of those buildings, their busing percentages, and the lunchroom percentage. So let's just look at this one in the software. Got to log back in. Okay, so the periodic menu, and then building profiles. And I have each of my schools entered in here. Um, if they need to create a new building, they would be able to just click create. They'd enter their IRN.
and then fill out the square footage and the percentages. Um, and I believe the percentages do want to add up to 100 percent um, for when they're reporting. So um, this is good for them to review each year as well, even if they do already have these entered in here. If they need to modify an existing building, they can edit these. Uh, so you just click your edit button, update what you need to, and save. And if it's something that, um, you know, maybe one person in the district reviews that's not necessarily uh, the treasurer or, you know, maybe this is just something that they want to save, there is a um, report here. So SSDT, District Building Information, this is a really simple report. You don't even really need to put any options. Um, it's basically just going to give you a PDF version of exactly what we saw um, on that grid. So, you know, maybe this is something that they prefer to review it on a report or even if this is a report they want to run and stick in a folder. Sorry, I've got a bunch of windows here, so I'm just trying to make sure I'm keeping an eye on the chat if anyone has questions. Um, okay, let's see. Um, so on our presentation, we do have a screenshot um, of how to find that report so that when you're going through this with your districts, you can reference that. Um, the next thing is account validation. There is another report in here for, um, it's called SSDT account validation report. And that'll let you pull up to see if there are any invalid account dimensions that were used. Um, if they do exist, then you can use account change under utilities to change um, those account dimensions to an account that is valid. And um, a note here that it doesn't, it, it checks for um, maybe like funds that aren't used anymore, uh, different pieces of the account code that um, you know, ODE has designated as no longer valid. Um, but there are some other level one or two validations that they can get that um, do have to do with how different pieces of the account codes are used um, that don't necessarily show on this report. It's, this report is basically showing you um, just if that piece of the account code specifically is no longer valid, not so much how it's used. Um, so here on this uh, slide, we have a couple examples of different uh, errors that you could get in the data collector. And um, if they do get those and if they are fatal, if there are some level one or two uh, reports of fatal errors, even after they have closed, they do still have the opportunity to reopen June and make necessary changes. So um, I would recommend that they run this report now, just double check and make sure they, you know, at least have valid accounts and then those other things they'll be able to address later on. And this one's near the top, so I'm not going to um, filter for it. It's right here. All right, and I could go ahead and just run this wide open. I do have one filter option here that's exclude accounts with zero amounts. Um, so if I do this, if I put in true, it would only show me um, any accounts that, that have amounts associated with it. So um, those, so when the amounts get reported, those are the ones that are really relevant. Um, I'm going to leave it blank because I ran this earlier and I actually, my accounts are all actually valid for the ones that have figures. But we want to see what this looks like. So just running for everything we have out there um, to take a look. And I don't think this one takes too long. There we go. Um, so it just has your full account code. It does look at cash accounts. Um, it's looking at different expenditure accounts and uh, gives you the description and your validation message. So uh, basically, you know, 494 is not a valid fund code. If you were to go look this up in the EMIS manual, um, you would see that this was a fund that was used um, years ago, but it was discontinued use after 2014 or something like that. The 
The other thing you can check is the EMIS fund categories. Um, the existing EMIS fund categories in Classic are not necessarily implemented in redesign. We did bring them over and they're under one of the custom fields. Um, we've been checking, we've been trying to uh, get official word from ODE for the last couple years on if they're still in use. Um, but they really uh, haven't said, you know, that they're using them um, necessarily. So it's it's not a fatal error if it's missing. Um, so basically districts can review these if they want. They can choose to continue to add them um, in that field, uh, but it may not necessarily be um, be needed. So at this point, it's kind of just like, you know, a uh, error on caution kind of thing, depending on if this is something that they want to keep um, adding. So uh, this is on the cash grid, and um, we have the screenshot here, but you can basically add this EMIS fund category to the grid, um, or you could do an advanced query. And if you filter by um, this less than, greater than, and a space, it'll show all of your funds that contain the EMIS fund category. If they wanted to keep adding them, um, so here's a note in the section where you could find this in the EMIS manual, and this has a listing of all of the EMIS fund categories that they could use. So basically, if they look at that, they can manually enter them in. So this is going to be under your core accounts, and we're going to go over to the cash account tab. And uh, what I want to do is come to my more option. I should let my page load first though. Okay, come to my more option. And then um, if you scroll down and open the category for the standard custom fields, the EMIS fun category is in here. So we can add that to our grid. And we want to go back to cash. Let's move it over here. Um, so a lot of these are blank, but in order to see the ones that are not, so it's um, our arrows or our carrots and then a space. Yeah, I think just one space. <laughs> um, and then so it'll show us any that do exist in here. Um, and if we look at this record, let me just view one. It's down here under the standard custom field. So if you're just looking at a record, that's where you'd be able to see it. Um, if you did need to edit this or if there's a fund when you're creating it, this is where you would reference, okay, here are my uh, list of codes from the EMIS manual, and then that's where you would manually type it in. Uh, the next part is to check the operational units. Um, you can view the OPUs. This one has a report too. It's the OPU listing. Um, I'm not going to show this one because it's kind of similar idea to what we looked at with the building report. Um, basically, if you go to the core menu and look at the OPUs, you'll get your grid. It'll have um, like the screenshot here. You'll have your code, your description, and then the IRN that that's associated with. Um, these did come over from Classic. And um, so, the, so those are all be in there um, from from the migration. Those are being used on the accounts. But if they needed to add a new OPU at some point, um, at this point in the year, it's good to kind of review those, review the IRNs associated with them, make sure all is correct because this does pull as part of um, their financial reporting. The next thing to talk about here is the appropriations. So we had a Fridays with Fiscal um, about a month ago, I believe, where Michelle went through uh, the budgeting process. Uh, they would use scenario, the scenarios option under the budgeting menu to enter next year proposed budgets and revenue estimates. Um, we also have steps on the wiki for further information on this. So we have a link right here. This is one of the helpful links that 
are listed on that um, fiscal year end documentation page. So if this is something that um, you're needing to help your districts with, then um, I would definitely refer to one of those resources as far as uh, the steps. So that brings us to month end closing. And the month end closing piece of this, it's really just the standard month end closing. Um, they would proceed to cl uh, close out with the month of June as normal. So they're going to be entering all their transactions for the month. They're going to be going through their reconcile process to um, reconcile their records with the bank. Um, we do have a link in the fiscal year on checklist for the bank reconciliation procedure. Um, under the periodic menu, they would be able to select the cash reconciliation and enter that information for the month. Um, we will talk about that in a little bit more detail on this one once we get to the fiscal year end. Um, and then their, their SSDT cash summary, so that's the redesigned version of their classic FinSum, um, and the SSDT financial detail, they would want to run those and make sure that the fiscal to date expended and received amounts would match. If they are able to balance out um, and all of those totals agree, then they would um, move on and run any other desired reports they want. Um, we've kind of had these listed out here since before the monthly report bundle, but that does exist now. So at this point, these other reports are listed for reference, but there is a standard set that will be saved and sent to the file archive. Um, so that's been, we've had that since about November. So again, just the standard. And yeah, in the note, it'll automatically run when the posting period is closed. So I'm not going to necessarily go through all these reports. I don't even know that there's any specific to point out because these really haven't changed. Uh, let's move on to the fiscal year in closing then. And this is where we start looking at some additional steps here. So uh, we mentioned that cash reconciliation um, and we want to make sure that that has been, uh, com has been completed for June because um, some districts will do this throughout the year. They'll enter their cash reconciliation, look at that every month, um, maybe print that out. But in June is the one time that they do need to do it because it will be included um, with their financial reporting. That's going to be under our periodic menu and cash reconciliation. Now I haven't created any in here yet. If they use this throughout the year, they may have you know, multiple cash regs listed in this grid. Um, but what we want to do is create a new one. And um, they would come in here, choose the posting period. So this fiscal year end specific requirement is that there's one for June. And um, this won't show the posting period in here until the posting period is created. So I noticed that in my testing that if I went in here um, and I was still in May and I didn't create June yet. Um, although I don't think that they would really be creating this now, uh, this is really going to be once they're at the end of June already. Because um, they're going to come in here, enter in their, um, their balances, their adjustments, and they can just um, come in, enter the amounts. They probably have more than $1,000. And then we click add and um, it would just go ahead and, and we can just add multiple lines onto each one here. This is, uh, they did have the cash reconciliation that they would fill out in classic. So um, this is the same idea as that. Um, I also want to point out that at the bottom here, we also have the uh, total fund balance. So this pulls from their system and the total entered balance pulls from what they've entered in these boxes. So this does give them an opportunity to make sure that everything that they've entered in balances as well. Once they're done with this, they would go ahead and save it up. And I'm not sure if I should have saved that without having it complete. Um, 
So actually, it's giving me a warning that it doesn't balance because I only entered a fraction of information here. So that's kind of nice. Um, and uh, they can clone these as well. So uh, that's the other thing. If they, if they do this each month or even if they do this once a year, um, once they enter this in, like if this is their first year on redesign and they haven't used these before, um, they may be creating it fresh this year and then next year they could come in clone uh, from the previous year and um, then they would be able to create their new cash rec from that and just maybe update the figures instead. They can also print it. Um, we'll hop back to the PowerPoint in a minute, but I'm just going to show the next thing as well while we're in the software. Um, so the next thing is to uh, fill out the federal assistance summary and detail. Um, these just got to um, be careful because the summary does need to be filled out first. These are in alphabetical order though, so um, they want to make sure that they're going to the summary before the detail. And then they would create the year, basically. And save this up. So now I have 2020 in the grid. And when I go to the federal assistance detail, now I can create my records and I, would, I get to pick the year from my drop down. So um, each year they'll want to go in and make sure that they add the summary first, then they're going to come in and attach the detail records to that summary record. Um, and they'll fill this out with um, the information they have um, regarding federal assistance. Uh, the grant title and the CFDA number. I um, believe that's all fairly standard and they would select the, uh, the cash account that that's attached to. Um, there is a tip that if they're looking for their 500 funds um, that they have to uh, create these detail records for, um, if I come to the core accounts, and then um, go to my cash tab. I can filter this pretty easily to narrow it down to my 500 funds. And then I have my fiscal to date received and expended columns on this grid. And um, they could just come in here and do um, greater than zero. And greater than zero. And then this will give them a list of different funds that they may need to enter those federal assistance detail records for. Um, and uh, there, there may be other funds that they're receiving federal assistance that are non-500, so this may not be a complete list, but um, it'll help out. Um, I do see a question in the chat. Does this copy over from Classic and is there a mass update to the new year. Um, if that's in regards to the federal assistance, I believe no, because I think they do have to enter this fresh every year um, anyways, even in classic, that was this was kind of that little uh, USAS, um, it was one of the EMIS related programs. Um, so no, I believe they will have to enter this fresh uh, each year. So it's not something that would come from classic. The next piece of this as well is the civil proceedings. So um, similar idea that's under the periodic menu and if they need to enter civil proceedings, uh, they have the information here where they would be able to enter the fiscal year and then um, the relevant information and save this up to be included with their financial reporting. Um, so Mary says, yeah, the, the federal assistance detail was what that question was about. And in classic, there was an initialization that would update the information and then they would just have to add the CFDA numbers. Um, I'm not aware that we have an option like that in redesign. I don't believe we do. Um, Michelle, if you know differently, um, feel that's, free to pipe in. That's correct. Um, we don't have anything like that. That's why um, uh, Amanda kind of showed you the, the cash grid and, you know, pulled up those 500 funds so that you could get those 
uh, fiscal year to date expended and received amounts so that you could plug those in there. So, um, so yeah, so Amanda was correct that information does not get imported or over. Um, some of those funds though, um, Mary, if those roll over into the new year, they'll still show on the grid. So you could always go in and modify those amounts then if some of those grant accounts roll over into the new year. So those um, amounts will stay out there on that grid. So you can make additions, make modifications and make deletions. Awesome, thank you, Michelle. Okay, so let me just pop back up the slide here. Um, yeah, I think we hit all the notes on this slide. Um, another thing in regards to our uh, EMIS extract, since most of these steps we're looking at is um, for this EMIS reporting for the financials, before generating this extract file, we want to make sure that the EMIS SOAP service configuration under system configuration is updated to reflect the fiscal year. Um, this was another thing that we kind of briefed on in the migrations training that we did, but this uh, fiscal year is not populated when you first come over um, in redesign because it's kind of a new uh, field. So uh, you do need to make sure that you go in here, change this fiscal year, or actually enter it the first time around. And then um, it is something that, you know, af if it's a district that's been on and they had this in there for last year, they may have updated it sometime in between, um, but this is a good thing to just make sure you check, make sure it's set to the correct year um, before you're trying to process um, any extracts uh, for EMIS. And we do have a note, we, I have some slides later that actually talk about configuring that SOAP service, so we will uh, talk about that as well. So we'll look at this, uh, this extract real quick. This is pretty straightforward. We're going to go into the extract menu and select EMIS. Um, we just select the fiscal year and generate the extract file. Um, this is the step that's going to actually extract those things that we just entered, the cash rec, the federal assistance information, civil proceedings. So we will get a warning message if those things are not entered in yet for the fiscal year that we're trying to pull for. Um, this is a file that's similar to the USA EMS underscore EMSR SEQ file. It doesn't contain the full information like that um, USA EMS file, so it doesn't have our account codes in it um, and uh, totals and OPUs. It's just basically this like supplemental information that we're pulling in this extract file. The other reports that we uh, want to run are these USAS auditor extract reports and a cash summary. Um, you want to save these in CSV format and attach those to an email and send it to the auditor of state. And we have the email right in the presentation here. And if I um, come to my report manager grid, uh, I think our example in the presentation was um, showing that you could do like wildcards with auditor or I could just do SSDT USAS since that's the beginning of all three of these. And that would allow you to pull these up and then you would just generate to the CSV and um, bring that right to your computer. Amanda, I have a question. Yep. Sorry to interrupt. Going back to the uh, reports for the auditors, um, sure. will those get saved on the fiscal archive when they run those? Or that's something that gets saved with your the fiscal year in reports that get saved on fiscal archive? You know what? I'd have to check. Actually, just a minute. Let me see if I have my list handy. Uh, yes, I, I have my quick notes from when we were looking at the fiscal CD report. So yes, I believe we included those. Um, 
we're going to talk about the fiscal CD in a little bit. It's coming out uh, actually next week. So we'll be updating the documentation with the official list of reports that will be included in there. Um, and that will probably be linked in the release notes too. So keep an eye on that um, for 100% confirmation, but I believe that they will be. Okay, thank you. No problem. Actually, that's a really good lead in because the next slide I have is about the fiscal year end reports here. Um, same idea as what we talked about with the month end reports. They can manually run and review any uh, desired fiscal year end reports that um, they may want to save or review. And we just kind of have the standard list on here. Um, I have a couple of slides with that. But we do have a fiscal year end CD that's going to be added. Um, that's scheduled for, I believe it's 7.42 that's coming out next Friday. And um, basically what we did is the, the month end, um, the month end bundle will run and a lot of those reports like the summary reports, your budget summary, that's already got fiscal to date totals on it. So that'll be um, a valid version of that. But in addition, there are some reports for fiscal year end that run on date ranges. So your financial detail, um, your uh, budget account activity, and uh, those reports are added separately to this fiscal year end bundle that will also run when you close June. Um, and I just want to look at where this is going to go. So our file archive here, this is where we're used to going to seeing all of our monthly reports. So the monthly June reports will still um, show on this grid. But there is also a separate tab here for fiscal year end reports archive and um, the specific fiscal reports will uh, go on to this grid. And um, thank you, Michelle, put in the chat. She did also double check for those reports on the fiscal year end bundle and all three auditor extract reports will be included. So the next step after they're balanced, um, they've got the EMIS extract all set um, for that uh, supplemental information. And so the, then they're ready to close out the fiscal year. Um, again, this is the same process as the month end pretty much. Uh, really easy. You're going to go into core posting periods and click that folder to close June. Um, the monthly and fiscal report bundles will automatically run when that last period of the fiscal year is closed. Um, I have a note on here. Um, I know that everybody's been uh, liking those report bundles. We have an option where you can um, set reports to automatically run um, also on that posting period close. A completed event or maybe they're scheduling some additional reports for fiscal year end. Um, if you have that set, the standard monthly and fiscal bundles, uh, it's basically written in to make sure that they can just use whatever month is being closed. But if you have custom bundles, it's going to run based on the current period. So if you have those set up, you want to give it a minute, give it five, uh, maybe check and make sure that all of those have completed um, just those custom bundles before you change the new posting period, or, I'm sorry, the new uh, current period. So just kind of a tip there, something to keep in mind. I mean, if districts don't have custom bundles, they can fly right through. Um, although, actually, maybe I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say that. Uh, not for June. Uh, June, I know also it does have quite a few calculations to go through. Uh, it creates some totals and stuff that are used for reports later on. So um, I know I'm kind of going off on this now, but um, I guess this is a good close to just make sure they give it an extra minute um, and let it calculate before they're just flying right on to creating that new posting period. Um, but when they are ready to do that, they can go ahead, click create to create the new posting period. Um, they're going to select June, enter the calendar year, and check mark the current box. And then um, once they save that up, that will, um, they'll be closed. They'll be in the new month and fiscal year. All right. 
And um, we have some more information in regards to the financial reporting. Um, now this slide, uh, I did update and tried to make sure I, I, I tried to copy the updated version of this um, presentation to that documentation page, but um, if you downloaded it previously, there may be an edit um, that you'll notice. Um, these data types, the SIF zone is picking up, so that, that's like your, um, through your SOAP service, um, that's picking up the cash budget revenue accounts and the operational unit codes. The flat files, this is what we just talked about with having um, the periodic, uh, all the stuff that we entered in periodic, sorry, <laughs> the um, cash account and, um, I'm sorry, cash reconciliation and the federal assistance information. The thing that's missing here is uh, the capital assets. So capital assets um, are no more as far as reporting. Um, of course, they still would um, want to do inventory, but we'll look at a couple um, messages re related to that. But if you have a copy of this presentation and it says capital assets still under flat files, you can remove that. And I'll try and make sure that that is um, updated for the um, current information on the website. So I promised some slides in regards to configuring the SOAP service with USSR. Um, this is a setup step basically to connect that uh, data collector to USSR. Um, the steps uh, are listed. There is a wiki page that is really helpful with setting this up. Um, but the basics, you're going to make a user and uh, set a password that can be uh, used to connect uh, to USSR. And there is a role, there is a standard role that's emis sif that can be attached to this user. Each district is also going to have it, its own SOAP and endpoint. So this is an example um, in our screenshot uh, right here. And uh, basically that's a URL that they can use to connect. So once um, you have those two pieces, then this part happens um, within the uh, configuration for EMSR. So this may be something that you partner with your tech uh, team on to get this set up, um, but basically you're entering in that URL and then the username and the user password that was created within USAS. There are a couple other steps too that may need to be done. Um, there is a certificate uh, key, a certificate to the key store, sorry, and um, we have a technical web page on that as well. Um, and that just allows access. So basically you're just setting up, you, uh, you're setting up USAS so that when uh, you go into the data collector, it can just automatically behind the scenes be able to pull all of those account codes and information. Um, so some additional notes on this, uh, because you're connecting uh, to pull those account pieces directly from the system using the SOAP service, the district really only needs to upload that EMIS extract that has the supplemental information to the financial data source in EMISR. Um, then when SIF is going, when they actually do their data collection, SIF is going to um, pull a portion of the information directly from the system, um, and that's based on the date that's in the configuration, and then also that extract file and put it together. So as far as when they need to report this, um, ODE has a draft schedule posted online. So if you go to um, ODE's website and search for um, the EMIS schedule or the EMIS calendar, you'll come to this page that will show the EMIS data collection calendars. And they have it posted for 19, 1920. Right now, um, the financial collection is scheduled to open on June 1st and close on August 31st. Um, we say this is a draft because it can change and it does change pretty often. So it is 
um, good to keep tabs on this and check ODE's website. And then that way, if you're um, you know keeping in contact um, or putting it in newsletters uh, to your districts um, to keep them updated on period age processing. Now you'll notice on this screenshot that the supplemental period is crossed out. Um, we're going to talk more about that. I have the actual memos, I promise, <laughs> um, in here. But um, basically, that was for capital asset reporting. So since that is no more, um, no longer needed, the supplemental period isn't needed anymore either. So here we go, post-closing procedures. And um, I've got the same tune as we've had throughout this. That financial data submission process, um, it is the responsibility of, a, of the district, so just something that they really don't want to forget. Um, you know, we just saw that period is open until the end of August. So if this is something that they're not going to do right away, that's fine, but they really need to make sure that it is sent to ODE before period 20 closes, or before period H for 2020 closes. Um, generally, uh, as far as running this through the data collector, that would be something that may be done by the district's EMIS coordinator or their treasurer um, to actually submit that. And we made it to the changes. So capital asset reporting changes for 2020. Um, we have a link to the website where this was noted. Um, and here's just a screenshot that shows capital assets are no longer needed and will no longer be collected. Um, and then because of that, the supplemental collection is no longer needed. Now, I'm sure that they'll still want to keep track of their inventory. So we do have our EIS. Um, close information. Michelle went over that in the classic webinar. We have a link to that documentation to that um, presentation um, is on the fiscal year end page that we looked at earlier with the training notes. So uh, they still may want to you know, be entering their inventory and closing out, but the stuff that they don't have to do is pulling the EIS EMS file and then loading that into the data collector to submit. Um, here's another memo, and this is just, again, in regards to removing that supplemental collection um, because it um, you know, doesn't need to have the capital asset items. And then the last thing here is um, running the gap. Uh, the gap conversion, well, I guess the gap extract. Uh, so this is also under that extracts menu. They would be able to go to gap. This one is really straightforward. So uh, we'll hop out just for, just for fun. Um, extracts, so here is the gap extract. There was the EMIS extract that we were talking about earlier. Um, but if we go to gap here, so, so simple. They really are just picking the fiscal year, clicking submit, and it's going to generate an output file that they would be able to um, save and then either email to whoever is going to be uploading that file into WebGap, or if they're the person that uploads it into WebGap, they can just take that file and, um, and load it. All right. Amanda? Yes. Is is that file going to go to ISA? Is it going to go directly there? Or we have to email it to them or they have to email it to them? The gap the gap extract file? Right. Uh it does not automatically go anywhere. So, so that, that would be I, something I'm thinking of you SAS odd, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. No, um the audit reports that we looked at earlier, those ones do need to be manual, do need to be emailed, and so we have the email in the presentation as well. Okay, okay I have another question. Sure, of course. Um, on the checklist itself, it talks about reopening a prior period. You know, we allowed districts to do the the USA EMIS DB and EMIS Edit from a uh, backup uh, from an archive. Okay. And I just want to clarify that uh, what you're saying is, you know, they can still do that as long as they did June in the redesign. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. So if they were, um, if they were imported, like, I mean, at this point, if they're already in redesign and they're going in, they're going to close June um, and move forward, then yeah, they would be able to reopen June um, as long as they don't have this rule enabled. Um, but if they are somebody who, uh, or if they're a district that is being imported after the start of the new fiscal year, then yeah, June from the last fiscal year is going to be archived, so they um, wouldn't be able to. I mean, I think in that case, they would be doing their financials from this year um, from Classic, so you could still use your previous procedure. Um, so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I don't know if I got it all. Yes, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Awesome. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? All right. Well, that is all I have. Thank you all for logging in today, and um, I hope fiscal year end goes well. I think we have um, another training coming up next month. Um, I think we have a couple. We have new contracts and then some um, use SR lookup tips. Um, of course, if you have any questions in the meantime before fiscal year end, feel free to let us know, put in a ticket. Um, but I hope everyone has a great day. And uh, thanks, thanks again for signing in. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda.